Good morning, everyone. I'm Craig Heller, president of the Sleep Research Society. And thank you uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, we are very pleased to be presenting this uh, timely focus group on non-positive airway pressure uh, treatment alternatives for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, very grateful to the panelists for giving their time and expertise on such short notice. Uh, this was only recently organized. And uh, we're also very grateful uh, for the chair, Dr. Sairam Parasarathi, for leading our discussion. Uh, so right now, I would like to introduce, introduce Dr. Parasarathi and uh, ask him to take over uh, the focus group. Thank you. Thanks so much, Craig. Thanks for the uh, kind introduction. Um, uh, it's uh, great to have uh, you all join us uh, this morning. Um, uh, we have a esteemed uh, uh, group of panelists. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, set out the objectives uh, for this panel focus group uh, discussion uh, and probably some rules of the road. And then we will uh, get to the list of the panelists, in which case I was uh, hoping that our panelists could uh, introduce themselves, uh, many of uh, all of whom don't need introduction, but I uh, will go through those intro introductions in an alphabetical order. Uh, so I'm Sai Parthasarathy, I'm from the University of Arizona, and um, we have here on the um, slides, if we can go to the next slide, <clears throat> the objectives of the focus group. Uh, this is a timely focus group on uh, non-PAP alternatives, namely dental devices and hypoglossal nerve stimulation devices for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea considering the current um, evidence. And the idea is to focus on various barriers and facilitators for adoption and implementation of such non-PAP treatment uh, with emphasis on access to care, expertise, how we put together a multidisciplinary team, uh, reimbursement, regulatory aspects, as well as uh, contextualize that with the current treatment guidelines, um, as well as reports from the EHRQ on treatment of obstructive sleep apnea the SAFE trial, the JAMA meta-analysis, and also most recently the Philips device recall. Uh, so the idea here is to identify knowledge gaps and research opportunities and also practice gaps and practice opportunities. So uh, welcome uh, everyone. Um, the, sort of the, uh, we'll go through the introductions and then we will uh, go through sort of the rules of the road. Uh, Dr. Fernando Almeida uh, um, uh, was unable to join us, so we'll uh, go with uh, Dr. Ayat. Uh, yes, I am on the GBIS. I'm a respiratory critical care physician at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Uh, uh, Dr. Bogan? Yes, uh, Rick Bogan. My, my apologies again for the lighting. I'm in a hotel room in Tampa, Florida, <laughs> so in the bedroom. So uh, at any rate, yeah, I'm, I'm pulmonary critical care training and uh, sleep medicine and uh, affiliated with the University of South Carolina School of Medicine and the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kushida? Yes, hi, I'm, I'm Klee Kushida. I'm a um, sleep specialist uh, with a neurology background. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Oileng? Uh, hi, Joe Ojile, sleep in uh, pulmonary medicine in St. Louis, Clayton Sleep Institute, and affiliated with St. Louis University. Uh, Dr. Patel? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm a dentist. I'm affiliated with Banner University Medical Center, University of Arizona, Arizona. in Tucson, Arizona, and I'm with the uh, size group. <laughs> uh, Dr. Prasad? Morning, everyone. My name is Bharti Prasad. I'm at the University of Illinois at Chicago. I do academic sleep medicine. Uh, uh, Dr. Rappaport? Yes, I'm uh, David Rappaport. I'm, I'm uh, um, trained in pulmonary and critical care, but uh, I have long time specialized in sleep. Uh, my interest is in the epidemiology and uh, and the, uh, the, the the physiology of uh, of, um, of sleep apnea. And I met uh, Mount Sinai at uh, the Icon School of, of uh, Sleep uh, Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, uh, Dr. Strahl. Hi, I'm uh, Pat Strahl. Um, pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. I'm vice chair of medicine for veterans affairs at the University of Pittsburgh and have a, a longstanding involvement with upper airway stimulation. Great. 
Uh, Dr. Van der Ricken. Good morning. I'm Olivier van der Weken. I'm an ENT head and neck surgeon at the University Hospital of Antwerp in Belgium. And I am also affiliated at the University of Antwerp. Main research projects are indeed in the area of the upper airway treatment in obstructive sleep apnea, including oral appliances, mm -hmm. upper airway stimulation, and transoral surgery. Uh, Dr. Viviano. Hi, uh, I'm John Viviano, a dentist in Ontario, Canada, that has a practice dedicated to dental sleep medicine, um, the management of sleep apnea and snoring with oral appliance therapy. Great. Uh, thank you. Thanks all uh, for uh, making the time, uh, you know, besides your busy schedule at such short notice uh, to be uh, uh, on this panel. Um, I just wanted to sort of uh, um, give the outline of how we're going to handle uh, the focus group today. Uh, we're going to touch upon some uh, thematic areas, um, starting with um, definition of treatment failure, um, and then the question about what is first-line therapy, uh, and then multidisciplinary models of care, and looking at barriers and facilitators, and lastly, looking at special cases, and as well as uh, any other additional thematic areas or topics that you want to discuss. These are all questions and uh, areas of discussion that were posed by all of the panelists. Uh, we will be discussing them in a thematic area. Some of them can be a little bit more uh, controversial or uh, thorny, and we may want to spend more time, but in the interest of covering all of the topical domains, we will move, uh, and I'll keep time on that. If uh, attendees have questions, you can post them in the Q&A. Uh, that would be the preferred area to post your questions, and I will be moderating it, and as we focus on each thematic area, I'll bring up those questions that came up in the thematic area so that we can post that to the panelists. Um, and so just for the panelists, please don't hit the answer to any of the questions. Um, uh, I'll be here moderating that so that uh, I don't lose track of any of the questions that's being posed. Um, for the audience, uh, you can put questions uh, in the chat. And of course, uh, pretty late in the pandemic, we to be telling you how to be uh, operating those tools in Zoom, but, um, but just be careful if you're sending a message to everyone or, um, or, or uh, individually to some other member. Um, uh, just uh, just see who you're sending to because the person you send it to before is the default mode. So without much ado, we'll jump into the first thematic area, which is uh, definition of treatment failure. And so the first uh, topic there is uh, what is the threshold for uh, treatment failure and when to consider alternative therapy? And by that, the assumption is that, that CPAP was uh, chosen as the gold standard treatment, and uh, we are trying to adjudicate uh, when someone has failed CPAP therapy for us to be uh, going towards hypoglossal nerve stimulation or a dental device. Uh, so um, I'll pause there to see if there are any takers and panelists for how you want to define that, especially in the context that close to half the people are non adherent to CPAP therapy. Yeah, this rig i'll start with a clinical um you, you know when i see my patients in the clinic um and we talk about pathophysiology and the, the clinical relevance and outcome measures with the patients um you know we talk about the downloads and things like that but i tell them there are four goals of therapy from my perspective and these are quantitatively up for debate but you know the i tell them the main thing i want to do is minimize oxidative stress uh, i want them to get plenty of oxygen I would like for their events, and we can debate about what the event is, whether it's AHI or whatever, but I'd like their events to be less than five, close approaching zero. Um, also, when I want to eliminate loud snoring because snoring is a signal that there's increased airway resistance, increased work of breathing and can fragment sleep. So I also want to eliminate snoring. And then the fourth thing I tell them I'd like to do is decrease work of breathing. I, I want to make it easy to breathe, thus, uh, minimizing the fragmented sleep. And then parenthetically, the fifth thing is I would like for the treatment not to be worse than the disorder <laughs> by introducing more sleep fragmentation, et cetera. So those are the guidelines that I actually give my patients and they seem to take that and run with it. And it has some relevance, I think, in terms of our research and outcome measures, et cetera, because we don't have a good biomarker for phenotypic um, vulnerability to these abnormalities. 
Uh, thanks, Rick. I think, you know, when you say the biomarker, I mean, I think it's the right way that you ended it because I want to segue off of that, uh, which is, you know, what is called a surrogate biomarker. You know, uh, examples of that are hemoglobin A1C for diabetes or RNA copies in HIV, uh, which actually closely is related to the outcomes of that patient. Uh, uh, but I was wondering what the panel thinks about an AHI of five per hour. I, I just worry that many of my patients, uh, uh, you know, struggle to be adherent as well. So should it be a composite of what we call an effective AHI, which is a combination of the AHI value and adherence, um, Rick or um, others? So, so I, I wonder if I could jump in here on, on answering your yeah. question, but also in, in responding to, uh, to Rich, who has very correctly, I think, identified where we want to go. Um, in response to what you're saying, I think it's important that we actually at least record that concept in everybody's minds, because there's been a lot of focus over the last uh, 30 years of CPAP at how good the treatment is when you wear it, and very little has been done about including the period you don't wear it. Clearly, if you wear it for an hour and it's perfect, and you sleep seven hours and it's not perfect or nothing at all for those other six hours, there's a problem. And so if you're trying to improve outcomes or physiological markers, you have to take both into account. The effect of AHI is, is certainly one of the things on the table. There may be others. But I wanted to take it in a slightly different direction, which is to um, sort of highlight the fact that in my mind, there are two conflicting trends that have evolved in what we're doing. The first is that there's a lot of work going on to try and get to where we want to go. So people are trying to find ways to enhance CPAP adherence, or for that matter, adherence with any or tuning of any other treatment. That takes time and money. And so, you know, uh, group sessions with patients to get them to wear their CPAP, multiple visits with a dentist to adjust the oral appliance, and so on. Huge amount of investment in proving that something works in the literature and then implementing it. And all of us have opinions on what kind of things work. What I'd like to highlight is that and I think your question does it very well, there ought to also be a point at which uh, futility is decided upon. And that doesn't have to be complete futility, but I think that if you're still working a year later at figuring out how to get a patient to put on their CPAP or to turn it on, we would all agree that that's kind of like, you know, trying to give somebody chemotherapy as they are dying from their cancer uh, with drugs that are known not to work. So, so I think what is important for the field is to say, okay, what do we know at which point you switch away from something which has a 95% chance of having failed and try something else, or at least discuss something else? Because that's probably more important at this point than what can I do to salvage one or two patients out of a thousand who have failed for a period of time. And I would suggest as an extreme version of that, that maybe at two weeks, the data suggests that if a patient hasn't turned on their machine or used it for an hour or two, you're probably not going to get anywhere in the majority of cases, and you ought to consider something else. Um, there are probably some other metrics that are worth considering, but I, I would like to hear other people's reaction to, you know, when do you give up rather than what can we do to improve exclusively? David, I'd like to chime in on, on that concept, if, if you can hear me, but... I I, part of it, I think for us is expectation setting to start to grade people based on their severity so that we set, a, a, we set expectations for therapy in, in a similar way as we mature as a field like hypertension or other disease states where the therapies are maturing based on, on certain outcomes and parameters that are sought. So a severe apneic, our goals and expectations would be a bit different than the milder apneic which if they have tolerance issues early on and they have relatively few symptoms, the ability to abandon therapy is part of the expectation set at the beginning. So a mild apneic will frequently tell them, hey, look, here's the options, but if you want to try this, we'll try it. If it doesn't appear to help you, we're going to have a low threshold to abandon the therapy versus a severe apneic, someone who's stopping breathing 80 or 80 or 100 times an hour, we're going to push um, a little more vigorously 
on trying to get therapy to be successful the way we perceive it. And, and as you've advocated, and Dr. Bogan have advocated very passionately and successfully to have a physiology-based um, therapeutic intervention. The goal is to open the airway, um, not necessarily to be a therapy salesperson. So, you know, if, if the goal is to open the airway and we show every patient the physiology and the models and how we choose to do that or how the patient perceives that to be successful, if we build that into the model up front during the conversation, in our experience, it's made therapy more successful, allowing us to push our success rates with PAP to 80%, but also to allow people to have frequent and easy access to other alternative therapies as mainline therapies, such as oral appliance, um, and now some of the newer therapies coming on board. So I guess part of, part of how we tend, or I tend to approach it is, um, to start out with the physiology and then the severity of the physiology aberration as far as the upfront diagnose, the upfront discussion, and then measure failure from that. So failure in someone who has an index of say 10 um, on their initial diagnostic is a little different than someone who has an index of 100 and how we would treat that patient. So I would only throw that into the mix of this robust conversation. Great, uh, thank you. I, I, I love the discussion going towards some individualization of therapy and based on risk. Uh, Pat, I know you've had your hand up there for a bit. Yeah, yeah. So, so Sai, I think you know it's important to look at this from from with a, two lenses, basically the patient's perspective and the provider's perspective. And, and I think sometimes this is misaligned. Um, you know, from a pers provider's expect, uh, perspective, as, as Rick had pointed out, I mean, our standard swindle is that we are going to prevent cardiovascular disease, but we, we have to be realistic. We do not have good data that PAP therapy actually improves cardiovascular or metabolic mm -hmm. risk with the exception of maybe resistant hypertension, you know, um, so, so what I see, you know, in, in our practice, we do a lot of second and third opinions. Is, and my fellows kind of say, I, I stop more PAP therapy than I start. Because a lot of times, you know, people get referred for very mild sleep apnea that are not particularly sleepy, and they have an insomnia complaint. And, you know, we, we've sometimes oversold the notion that we're going to prevent a heart attack by treating trivial sleep apnea. And that may not be the patient-centered reason that they're coming to the doctor. So, so alignment of, of what, the, what is truly in the medical best interest needs to be uh, kind of coincide with both the provider and, and the patient. And, uh, you know, we do know uh, that treatment of sleep apnea in certain individuals makes them feel better. And, and the MERGE trial nicely showed that. And that's not to trivialize that. And, and, and the paradox that we have in clinic is the patients that come back to see us in clinic on a repetitive basis are usually very adherent to therapy. But there's, we don't know the denominator. There are people who just you know, go away and they go see Oliver, or they go see uh, Dr. Viviano, uh, because they just don't want to have any part of therapy. And, and I think what the discussion today has to be, how do we really integrate all the treatment options like, uh, like Joe had mentioned, you know, and, and not be so PAP-centric. PAP therapy works very well in a, in a very important group of patients, but there are people that, that, and I like the idea, and this is what I do in my practices, I say, we're going to start with PAP therapy because it's easy to start it's easy to take away, but it's not the only tool we have in our toolbox. Thank you, Pat. Great. I really, uh, I love that approach. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I can add. Dr. Have... Viviano? Yeah, sorry. Uh, um, sorry, um, I don't know who was commenting there, but yeah, I think great. Dr. Viviano put his hand up. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Uh, okay. Rick, um, if you I'm have sorry. a follow-up uh, comment to that, so you did, can go ahead and comment. Uh, sorry, I couldn't see Rick, though. You, you speak. Rick, why don't you go ahead and comment, and then we'll give it off to Dr. Viviano, yeah. who's moving to a different topic. Yeah, no, I just, um, I th you know, there are a couple of operating principles, and uh, patients come to us for two reasons. Uh, you know, they say, Doc, I don't feel good. I'm going to feel better. Something's wrong with my sleep. 
And then the other is, um, you know, I, I, um, I don't want to die. I don't want to be sick. Is there something that can, we can do to make that better? And um, so those, as Pat says, we have to keep both of those in mind when the patients come to us. I mean, are they really at medical risk? And, and, can we make that and the other is, right. that is, I know starting out that at least 20% are not going to use it. They're clearly not going to use it. And another 20% are going to kind of use it. Um, and so I, I have a lot of patients that need alternative therapy. So I think it's, appropriate to put it in a quantitative perspective as well as some of these outcome opportunities. So uh, just to just to expand on what was already said. Great. Thanks, uh, Rick. Uh, uh, just uh, we're getting some noise interference. I think if uh, people can mute your uh, microphone if you're not speaking. Um, Dr. Lohan, uh, uh, good to see you join us. But Dr. Lohan, I think the interference is coming from your end. So please, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Viviano, it's your turn. I think uh, Dr. Viviano may have uh, had his internet freeze there. Najib, oh, Dr. Viviano, do you want to oh, go? I'm, I'm, I'm good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. We can. Uh, so the, the question I have refers to the 80% adherence that was mentioned um, for, for PAP therapy. And so the question I have is, is that... Um, you know, basically we're talking four hours a night, five days per week type thing, or are we talking they're really adherent therapy in light of the HRQ and SAVE and the JAMA report and everything? Uh, you know, we understand that if we're using the criteria of four hours a night and you know, five days a week, it's not really um, doing what we expect it to do, right? And so when, when people are referencing these numbers, and I hear this, these types of statistics also for my local sleep specialists uh, all the time, um, you know, I wonder, you know, if so that we can talk apples to apples. So we understand adherence, really, they are adhering to the therapy for the majority of the night, um, rather than the criteria that has been used for years of, of four hours, because it makes a big difference with regards to how we, we view that, uh, that finding. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Uh, I, I just didn't wa want to mention uh, uh, that uh, there is a question in the panel uh, in the Q&A that is essentially very similar to yours, uh, saying that, uh, you know, can there be discussion about uh, the HRT report and the fact that, uh, uh, you know, uh, people need to be adherent for five days a week, four hours. Uh, my understanding, uh, Dr. Viviano, uh, is when uh, the... Uh, a U meta-analysis in JAMA was done when they did uh, uh, look at the stratified uh, and did a sensitivity analysis on just the uh, patients or the data sets that um, were adherent. I mean, even in sensitivity analysis in these various studies, if they took the people who are adherent based on that criteria, which is, you know, five nights a week, four hours, or more than four hours a night, if you're looking at some observational studies that came from the Spanish group, but there was indeed protection against cardiovascular events and strokes. But unfortunately, the primary study was powered not for that subset, and uh, the primary endpoint ended up being uh, uh, not met. Um, however, in all of these studies, when they did a subset analysis of adherence based on the adherence criteria that we have, uh, there was a signal. Uh, I'll pause there to see, you know, see if uh, I need to be corrected on that. Um, uh, if there are any studies out there where that was not the case, uh, it's probably a good time to, to to do that. But I do agree with you, Dr. Viviano, that um, many uh, practices uh, claim some exorbitantly high uh, adherence rates uh, that don't seem real. Um, and also, if you look at the data, looking at just the adherence in randomized controlled trials, they're always much lower than these convenience samples or population samples or practice-based samples that claim and boast about a 70, 80% adherence. We know that if you look at the adherence in all of the intervention arms or all the PAP studies, the adherence is closer to about 50%. So uh, I'll just drop that and uh, move to <laughs> in Najib to get the Najib's thoughts uh, uh, because Najib had his hand up for a bit. 
Uh, yeah, no, thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, I, I just wanted to 100% say that I agree with what Pat Strollo had mentioned as well. I think that one of the things that we tend to lose sight of is that the major things that patients are interested in. I've never had a patient come up to me saying, oh, I, I really want to get my oxidative stress down or I want to keep my airway open or those things. Like what they're more interested in is I want to feel better during the daytime, I want to get my sleep better. And then some individuals are, you know, I'm concerned about my heart and those things. And I think that from my standpoint, those are the two major things that patients are, are really concerned about. And I think that we need to put that the forefront. So if patients are having a lot of problems with CPAP such that their quality of life is worse than the CPAP then without, I have a lot of difficulty in terms of getting people to continue the, the therapy. Because as far as I know, just to reiterate his PAP point, I don't think that there's compelling data, especially in mild to moderate sleep apnea, that treatment of that is going to improve their longevity or their cardiovascular mortality or those things. Uh, the second point that I'd like to make is that in terms of the AHRQ or the UMED analysis, and again, this is kind of more my opinion and I think that you need to be a little bit careful extrapolating from some of these randomized control trials because in general, if you look at the SAVE study or the Ricotta study or Isaac study, they do tend to focus very much on individuals who are not symptomatic or are not sleepy, I think for a couple of reasons. One reason is that ethically, it's very challenging to randomize symptomatic patients to CPAP or no CPAP. So I know that our ethics board would not allow me to do that, to randomize someone for three to five years if they are symptomatic at all. The second thing is in terms of the patients, I think the patients themselves would not be agreeable to being randomized in a study like that for a prolonged period of time as well. So consequently, in those studies, you get very asymptomatic individuals. So the question is, I think that for asymptomatic individuals, I don't think that CPAP has a compelling um, you know, signal in terms of reducing cardiovascular disease. But I think it's really coming out from you know, studies by uh, Diego Mazzotti, and then there was a recent Chilean study in, uh, in chest that showed that individuals who are symptomatic or sleepy tend to have a higher cardiovascular rate uh, as well. And it's probably a marker for the fact that these individuals may have more cardiovascular risk associated with the sleep with sleep apnea uh, as well. And in addition to that, if you actually look at the adherence rate for SAVE or Ricotta or Isaac, it ends up being very low, again, probably because these individuals are not symptomatic. And it's very difficult to get asymptomatic individuals to use something like CPAP for prolonged periods of time. And that personally has not been my clinical experience in terms of adherence to, like, I don't think that's mimicked by what happens in those studies. So I think that you really need to be careful about extrapolating that. I think that we need studies of sort of symptomatic individuals. I think it's difficult to do randomized studies, but, you know, longer like propensity match trials that Alan Pack talked about or, or Greg Maislin or those things, you know, may be helpful as well. But my own gut feelings in patients with very severe sleep apnea, there probably is some effectiveness in terms of reducing cardiovascular events, looking at some of the animal studies and the short-term physiology studies as well. But again, there's not really a lot of robust clinical data as well. Thanks, uh, Najib. I, I like the way you, you know, reset the discussion and summarized everything that has been said so far and encapsulated really uh, nicely. So thanks for that. Um, uh, it's uh, David, Barty, and Oliver are our next. Um, but I just wanted to pose a question that if, if you're saying that it's the non-sleepy people that are part of randomized control trials because that's what you know could be done ethically and they're not representative of the sleepy folks, uh, sleepy pa patients who are, have obstructive sleep apnea and sleepy, and because they are the ones uh, who appear to be at greater cardiovascular risks and events, uh, how would you design a study? Are, are we talking about a comparative effectiveness study where we pitch? You know, in other words, it's not going to be a placebo control anymore. That you take sleepy apneics, I'm sorry to say that, but I'm just saying it to summarize because people shouldn't be defined by the disease. It's people with apnea who are sleepy and randomize them to two therapies uh, as a head to head comparative effectiveness study. Is, is that the way that you would tackle that? Or how does the field move forward um, from the HRQ report? Oh, I have no idea. I think that more smarter people have to figure that out as opposed to me. I think that if I had some certain opinions, these are sort of my, my opinions. I think that randomizing somebody who's sleepy for like five years of CPAP or no therapy is going to be very problematic. I think that's kind of a no-go. So the issue is what are sort of your other options and whether you have multiple options. So one option is to do more of an observational study to say, okay, what we're doing, going to do is we're going to compare individuals who are adherent to CPAP if CPAP adherence is 50, 60 percent and compare them to those who are not adherent and have, you know, robust measures of propensity analysis looking at adherence to other therapies or lifestyle or those things that actually will tell you if people are adherent 
coherent or not. Now, obviously, there's limitations to that in that uh, reasons that the reason the patients are not adherent to therapy may also affect their cardiovascular risk because maybe they may not be adherent to exercise or those things. And so that's going to be somewhat challenging, but I think that would be one option. Uh, the second option that people have talked about is to say, okay, well, maybe we can randomize people to using CPAP, uh, you know, just regular CPAP to using CPAP and try to really get them to use their CPAP and have measures and then go to a backup like a dental appliance and, and really comprehensively treat their sleep apnea. Uh, that's going to be a bit problematic too, because then all of a sudden you're comparing individuals who are partially treated to those who are kind of treated. And you can argue, say that the delta signal that you're going to get from that is very small. The third option I've heard is, oh, maybe we should treat them with, you know, um, modafinil or some kind of stimulant versus CPAP, you know, because then there's, that's sort of ethical because they're not going to get into a car accident. You could already say, well, there's a problem with that too, because maybe modafinil might increase risk and stuff because, you know, you get blood pressure changes or those things. So I think all these things are problematic. I don't have a great answer. Maybe other people do have a better answer about how to design something like that. But yeah, I think it's problematic. If you're trying to get the answer of, is our symptomatic individuals, if you treat them with CPAP, going to reduce their cardiovascular risk? Yeah, I think it's going to be difficult to, to design a study that's going to be, um, that's going to answer that. Great. Uh, Rick had a follow-up question to that on the topic and then to David. Uh, Rick, very quickly. Yeah, no, yeah, I was, um, it, it occurred to me, um, Najib, to put on the spot because uh, the question is um, how much and how long, and then the other is, um, what, is there any value in doing comparative studies? I mean, long-term comparative studies of alternative therapy and comparing the outcomes from those, because we all, we have things that are approved to treat. I mean, can we do comparative studies and how long should we do it? And then there, um, and there was, you know, an observational study from Spain. I can't remember the, the uh, author now, I'm sorry, but uh, that looked at improvement in um, survival. It was observational, uh, but it looked at improvement in survival in individuals who used the CPAP versus those who did not. So, so there is some evolving data. Uh, problematic, but, uh, can I, no, I was just going to say that, that the irony about the SAVE trial is that patients were enrolled that were non-sleepy, but one of the positive improvements from the CPAP in the SAVE trial was actually less a decrease in, in daytime sleepiness. So that's the irony is that obviously a lot of patients aren't really that aware of how sleepy they are. And because we don't do PBT on patients, we really can't uncover that. But and, and I would say also, I mean, we could argue about the utility of, of subgroup analysis, but I mean, state did have, obviously, if you're using more than four hours, there was a 48% uh, reduction in stroke. So, and those were non sleepy patients, but that, that is obviously a big problem in most of those clinical trials. I agree with that, that unfortunately, the cardiovascular outcomes trial mostly were, were randomized non sleepy patients. Got it. A great point there. Uh, 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 thank you, Abbott. I know Cleet has a follow-up uh, uh, to that because he studied sleepiness and individuals sleep apnea in the Apple study. So, Cleet, uh, very quickly, and then uh, we'd have to break and go to David. Yeah, I was just going to um, just bring up the point that uh, there have been some comparative effectiveness studies looking at, for instance, uh, CPAP versus oral appliances. And uh, we did one also, uh, Peter Sisuli uh, did one as well. And uh, one of the struggles is you know, how do you match up the adherence? Um, but with the oral appliances now, you can actually you know, have a temp temperature sensitive chip embedded within the oral appliance to, to look at adherence, but it's not a, a perfect um, solution, but there have been these types of studies. And I think that you know, that's one of the things that should be looked at more and more studies like that uh, being conducted. Uh, great point, Cleet. Uh, thank you. And looks like more and more of uh, uh, adherence with dental devices is being done even in the real world. So, uh, David, uh, thanks for waiting uh, patiently. Uh, back, back to you. So, uh, I'd like to respond. I actually had another point, but I'd like to respond to the discussion, the thread of the discussion. It seems to me that the evidence that we have so far is so inconclusive that we should back up a little bit from asking the question, how does one treatment compare with another, to asking the question that was implied by a lot of the discussion, which is when is treatment worth doing? And one theory is make the patient less sleepy if that's their complaint, that seems like a no brainer. The other is deal with patients who are not aware or not sleepy and who have a provable risk. A lot of diabetics are not aware that their high sugar is bad for them, yet we treat it. So if you can prove that, 
So to me, the big question that we need to answer is, does treatment produce an improvement? And you can choose any outcome you want, whether it's just sleepiness or whether it's cardiovascular. But to me, there's a fundamental flaw in what we've done so far. And that is we've chosen a treatment that should have been perfect, CPAP, and now discovered that people don't use it in substantial numbers. And you can argue about what that is. And that has prevented us from answering what seemed like a simple design. You asked the question of how you would design an experiment. And I'd like to throw out something. I've been pushing this for a couple of years with relatively little uptake, but I'd like to hear other people's reaction to it, which is, you know, if you want to know if sleep apnea is bad for you, make it go away. And I don't care how it is that you make it go away. So why is it that we have not yet and we've proposed this, but other people have not been terribly excited about it. Why is it that we've not had a trial where we say, I don't care how you reduce the AHI. I want to enroll subjects whose AHI goes from some level to some other level I consider very good. And if they do it with CPAP, so be it. And if they do it at oral appliance, they're in also. And if they do it by a Ouija board, I also don't care. And why not say that the enrollment of a subject group is anybody whose AHI comes down. It seems to me that that will help us answer a very important question, which is, do they get better? And better can be less sleepy, it can be less cardiovascular disease, it can be anything else. Once we unequivocally have answered that question, yes, they get better, or no, despite good treatment, and everybody in this trial would have good treatment. Despite good treatment, they don't get better we will be able to then go about what's the best way to get to that end point. So I would like to throw that out. The other point I'll make, and then I'll give up the floor quickly, is, is in response to something a long time ago. And that is this idea of adequate adherence to uh, CPAP. It's my experience, and I don't know that there's a whole lot of data to support this, that it's not an average that counts, but there's a kind of a polarized group. If you take people who are adherent by the Medicare criteria of four hours, and you say anybody less than three hours is out of the group, and then average their usage, it's rarely four hours. It's usually closer to six hours. And that's one of the reasons why the numbers kind of bounce all over the place. So the average number, including all the people who are very poor users, is probably not interesting. If you're willing to say that anybody who uses CPAP less than three hours is probably non-adherent, but then you look at the average usage in everybody who is a user, they come out to much more heavily good users. And they are a group that is more interesting than taking the whole intention to treat group and saying the average usage is low. Because that low is made up of very good users and very poor users, and they're fundamentally different. Yeah, great point, uh, David. Actually, there's a question in the chat group uh, in, that is in that Q&A um, section, which is very relevant to what you just said also, is, is that a lot of the studies just look at the average hours, but they don't look at the first uh, part of the night versus the latter part of the night, because most people wear it for the first part of the night, and then they take it off. And then there's all this data, as Dr. Newhouse says, uh, of individuals who have uh, REM-related events, which are usually more severe, and REM-related events, independent of even the severity aspect, have been shown to be associated with greater amount of cardiovascular or morbid mortality in various observational studies. So it, perhaps it's not only the average hours, uh, the issue that you raised, David, but also w what time of the night is the machine being worn and what time of the night is the machine not covering the event. So a very important uh, uh, suggestion, I think, uh, that you brought up with regards to this. Uh, what I'm hearing is an adaptive randomized controlled uh, trial design uh, with various therapies being available to just make that uh, AHI zero out, including the Ouija board. Uh, famously, I think uh, we will coach you on that one. <laughs> uh, uh, Bharati, uh, uh, thanks for waiting patiently. Uh, go ahead. Always, thank you. Um, so, you know, just to round out the conversation and some of the things that have been brought up, I wonder if it's worth, you know, thinking about creating a composite outcome with, you know, patient-centered outcomes being the top and the primary, in my view, always, right? Does the patient sleep better and feel better and function better during the day? And finding some way to measure that that could be replicated across studies, right? 
And in there somewhere, you could certainly, for selected patients, make um, you know other measurements important. Um, for example, do they have atrial fibrillation that has failed? You know. Um, uh, treatment attempts or, um, you know, are they on two blood pressure medications and are they still uncontrolled, right? So those kinds of things that are very focused could supplement the patient-oriented outcomes. But I think having a composite like that or a scale like that, that we could replicate across studies would be um, very useful, I think, for clinicians. Um, and so that's uh, the first comment. The second comment I wanted to make is, you know, we've talked a lot about everybody knows how efficacious PAP is and how eff effectiveness falls off because of these adherence issues. And I wonder, and, and you know, David brought this up, uh, the front-ended adherence declare, declaration that's important, right? Um, within the first couple of weeks, um, patients tend to let uh, the physicians know that they're not doing well and they're not gonna use it probably. And I wonder, we, you know, despite all of this research, in the practice setting, whether it be a community-based sleep center or the primary care physician, we don't have a good mechanism to really support the patient in those first two weeks, right? And it, just realistically speaking, it's not going to be the sleep specialist, the MD, and it's not going to be a primary care MD. We, they just, the time isn't there, right? This is very time intensive. And I wonder if we could begin towards working and finding out who these, you know, physician extenders or these providers could be. And Sai, you know this very well. It could be a peer support group, but I, you know, something in a more PBRN or practice-based research network setup, right? We should be testing something that all of us can use, right? Well, this is a cost-effective model of really supporting that patient in that first two weeks. I think that's something that we haven't done very well. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, again, bringing the patient to the center of the discussion. I really appreciate you bringing the patient-centered uh, uh, outcomes uh, uh, angle uh, and uh, talking about how our uh, practices don't have the support mechanisms for that intensive first two weeks of therapy. The shameless plug: uh, we are doing a dissemination implementation of our peer intervention. Uh, just feel free to email me uh, if you want to implement that in your practice. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Bharati, is that, you know, a lot of payers are interested in value-based purchasing and they're interested in patient satisfaction. And uh, patient satisfaction is usually tied to patient outcomes. If they feel better, if the original problem, as Pat and Najib talked about is, you know, and Rick, you know, they come in with a particular question or an issue. If it got taken care of, they're going to be happy. They're going to be satisfied. So, something to be said about global patient satisfaction and, and whether we are all measuring that in the practice. So that, uh, uh, and I will summarize in a little bit. Uh, we have uh, um, Oliver with a, with a question. We'll discuss that and I'll then I'll have to encapsulate because we have to hop on to the next thematic domain. But uh, thanks, Bharati, for that. Uh, Dr. Van der Werken, uh, your turn. Yes, thank you. I, I uh, First of all, I think there are many good ideas among the things that were already set by the panel members. And of course, the question is quite difficult. What is the threshold or the definition of a treatment success or failure? But I think that I would love to summarize maybe that potentially a four dimensional model um, could be quite interesting where the first dimension indeed is this patient reported outcomes and satisfaction or subjective complaints that change due to the therapy. A second dimension should still be the oxygen values and, and probably all that you could have from data from, from a sleep study. Measurement of adherence was already mentioned. I think that's, of course, the third dimension. And, and a fourth dimension in the future, probably it's more feasible than it is now, is to at least have a first assessment of how will the comorbidity um, or the risk or, of cardiovascular and other comorbidity be changeable because of all the other three dimensions. And so, so I just like to add that to the whole of, of the discussion. Thanks. Wow, uh, you just made my job easy there. I think that was a beautiful encapsulation and summary of this particular thematic domain. I couldn't have done it better. Um, uh, and I'm glad this is being recorded. But if there's gonna be a white paper that generates clearly, that would be set up the 
encapsulation of this particular segment of our discussion. So thank you for doing that. Uh, um, so uh, besides those four uh, domains, I think um, uh, what was when you said uh, adherence, uh, there was another um, uh, discussant uh, who's an attendee who posed the question about effective AHI with multiplying efficacy times adherence. So I just wanted to um, give a shout out to our attendee, uh, Dr. Tolbert, for posting that uh, comment there. So uh, totally agree with you, uh, Dr. Tolbert. Um, and so we heard uh, the beautiful encapsulation by Dr. Vanderberken of the discussion items right now. Uh, I, I just wanted to add that some of the other means to that end of the four faceted model uh, machinations that would lead to that, uh, that were suggested is this sort of combined decision making as a way of doing it. Uh, I, I know that some of you are working on clinical decision support systems uh, like Dr. Prashad, and I think this would be a great opportunity for uh, the, that to be able to help with that combined decision making so that it is something that is operationalized and implemented uh, universally, as well as we got some great ideas from Najib on um, how they would design a, a long term comparative effectiveness research studies with ideas uh, from you know, David and others for what we would call an adaptive randomized you know, control trial. Uh, and uh, we also identified that the risk uh, of an individual patient with comorbidities or sleepiness or, or whatnot is going to be a key driver of that combined decision making and clinical decision support. Um, and uh, we did identify a barrier in practice you know, as to how are we measuring some of these things that are important for us and also how are we intervening towards adherence uh, early. Um, so uh, we've tackled two of the three questions here, um, but we do need to keep um, uh, moving on. Uh, but I do know that the particular query about how, if you choose CPAP, how it adversely affects future treatment is going to come up. But before we go into the next thematic area, I did want to uh, recognize Dr. Uh, uh, Dennis Wong um, uh, for you know joining us. Uh, Dr. Dennis Wong is uh, uh, you know, a, a well-established researcher from uh, Kaiser Permanente. Dennis, if you can just quickly introduce yourself, uh, uh, that would be great. Hi, good morning. Uh, Dennis, I, I wonder if you've been muted or if I'm having audio problems. Can people hear me? Can't hear you. Can't, can hear you, so I can't hear Dennis. Okay. Okay. Can so, you we can hear you now. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, I apologize for being late. Uh, I had some technical issues with trying to find the Zoom link. Uh, but I am the director of sleep medicine for Kaiser um, uh, San Bernardino County and also the co-chair for sleep medicine for the Southern California region. Um, and I uh, have I uh, had a few uh, leadership positions within the AASN uh, and certainly a big believer in alternative therapies. So very happy to join this discussion. Great, thanks, uh, Dennis. And Dr. Uh, Lone, Jonathan Lone, I know you joined late as well. If you can just introduce yourself before we go into the next topic. Yeah, hi, I'm sorry. Um, I'm actually in an airport. Um, so. Yeah, thanks for uh, letting me participate in this uh, discussion. And I'm, um, I practice internal medicine and sleep medicine in Comac, New York, and I'm the director of our, our lab as well. Thank you. Thanks for being able to join us and uh, uh, fly safe. Uh, um, so we'll move to the uh, topic. Uh, it's going to be a bit, you know, on the uh, a more provocative side. Uh, so I'll um, couch this by saying, um, you know, there's a comment uh, from an anonymous person online, uh, which also says that, uh, uh, you know, we are, you know, limiting uh, some of the alternative treatments uh, for, you know, uh, various uh, financial reasons and, um, and that uh, the viability of alternative treatment, um, you know, needs to be addressed, uh, you know, um, uh, head on. And so to actually, you know, offense is sometimes, you know, form of best defense. <laughs> and, you know, so the, I guess the question there is, is that um, should the alternative non-PAP therapies uh, be the first line of treatment? Um, I, I know Pat uh, and others say, uh, you know, sort of summarize it's easy to start CPAP, it's difficult to start 
hypoglossal nerve stimulation because you just got to go pat to it. Uh, and I'm sorry, uh, Pat was, uh, you know, being a little glib there. Uh, but being the first author, you know, in the New England Journal paper on hypoglossal nerve stimulation, and for our dentist colleagues who are on this panel, uh, I'm going to, you know, throw it out to you um, to take first bites at this question as to why should we not be offering, uh, you know, a hypoglossal nerve stimulation device or a, or are you offering such therapies uh, such as dental device as a first line of therapy uh, as opposed to CPAP? And, and if so, why? So uh, I see Dr. Viviano has his hand raised a millisecond before that, yep. Pat, so go ahead. I couldn't wait to raise my hand uh, on this one. Um, so the question I will ask is this. In 2015, AASM and ADSM uh, published guidelines on oral appliance therapy jointly. And those guidelines from six years ago state that an oral appliance is indicated as a standard of care for any severity of sleep apnea, if the patient can't tolerate PAP, or if the patient prefers an alternative a treatment to PAP, just patient preference being the guiding thing. So, I mean, that was established based on research that they reviewed, I think, prior to 2013 was maybe the cutoff, whatever, you know, and since then, there's been a plethora of more research that, you know, continues to support oral appliance therapy and how effective it is with outcomes and so forth. So I, I really don't understand um, this question in 2021. And that, what I, what I quoted out of the guidelines, I know in my local jurisdiction, Ontario here, there isn't any sleep or very few sleep physicians that would be even aware, cognizant of that, the fact that they would be considered a standard of care. And I think that that is an issue because that information is published in the guidelines at the top has not percolated down to the frontline uh, care providers that the dentists rely on to work with. And just as of uh, two weeks ago, one of the attendees from one of my programs called me up because he's having a problem getting the sleep specialist to write a prescription for an oral appliance because the patient can't tolerate his PAP, he has moderate sleep apnea. The sleep physician is refusing to write the script. So this is a, a real problem. So you're hearing this from somebody in the trenches. I teach this stuff, but also I work this stuff on a daily basis. So, so um, I, I, th that's what I'd like to throw out there for discussion because you know it seems like we're asking a question that has been answered, you know, before already, at least with regards to oral appliance therapy. Um, hypoglossal nerve stimulation is a relatively new procedure. So, of course, those guidelines wouldn't have been um, established yet. All right. I mean, totally I, in agreement, uh, hear your frustration. There's the guidelines and then there is uh, adoption of guidelines, right? And so I think that's where we are. So uh, thanks uh, for your comments, Dr. Viviano. Pat? Yeah, sure, Sai. So, so um, you know, in our practice, we we use a lot of oral appliance therapy. Um, we always have, you know, I, I think, you know, <clears throat> because it's a slightly a boutique practice because we don't see every patient that comes with a sleep problem. You know, they have to be referred to us. By the time they come to us, you know, we we put the whole tool, all the tools on the table. You know, and uh, we tell them, you know, oral appliance therapy is a you know, is an option for you. Um, you know, PAP therapy, depending on how sleepy they are, we generally would do PAP therapy first. Um, but we have many, many people who are involved with oral appliance therapy. I think it'd be also helpful for Oliver to weigh on, in on this because, you know, he's been a star investigator as well as heavily involved in the oral appliance treatment community. I think one of the things with oral appliance therapy that is a challenge is that, you know, our dental colleagues and our medical colleagues are not very well integrated with the electronic health record. So sharing of data is, is, is quite difficult in the United States and making sure that um, the treatment plan is well integrated is a challenge, number one. Number two is in the United States, at least, and at least in our region, uh, adherence is subjective, not objective. You know, we're, we use objective adherence for um, positive pressure therapy, and we use objective adherence for upper airway stimulation, but we do not use objective adherence to oral appliance therapy, even though the technology exists, although 
most of the technology is a little bit prehistoric and it's uncomfortable for patients and it's an extra cost for the dentist. And, and let's be honest, you know, most dentists who do oral appliance therapy are small businessmen. Um, and, you know, there, there may be a financial advantage to them as well as to uh, uh, sleep medicine doctors who are well aligned with the PAP therapy. Um, as I'll, I'll just finish up with, oral, uh, with upper airway stim. And in our practice, we never would at the present time would not use or, uh, upper airway stimulation as, as first line treatment. You know, it's, it's, a fa it, it's expensive, it's invasive, um, highly effective in properly selected patients. But I, I, I personally do not recommend upper airway stimulation unless somebody is at an adequate trial of positive pressure and they've been offered oral appliance therapy and um, elect not to use it or, or can't tolerate it. So, so that's, that's the way we uh, use uh, upper airway stim. So I'll stop there. Yeah, actually, if I can just uh, do a little vote there, just on that, is, you know, when we're having these discussions, there's oftentimes uh, a lot of discussions on both sides of the aisle and um, um, not in an of certain uh, regard. So, um, uh, you know, cons I would still want to hear from Dr. Randall Rickin on the uh, issue about the hypoglossal nerve stimulation. But Pat, based on what you just said, that you would never use AGNS as the first line treatment. If I were to put it for a vote and I see a thumbs up or a thumbs down, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys, if you folks can actually do that. Um, or maybe if uh, people can put your hands down and uh, uh, David or, you know, uh, and then David, I remember the order here, David and Jonathan and then uh, Najib. Um, so uh, a, a vote as to how many of you agree with the state, past statement that you, he would never use hypoglossal nerve stimulation as first line treatment for sleep apnea? Either it's a show of hands uh, electronically or real. Um, so I see Rick saying thumbs up as well. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so, uh, how many of you would propose uh, hypoglossal nerve stimulation as first line treatment? I see uh, Dr. Randa Rickin. And um, didn't know if uh, uh, Jonathan, you wanted to keep your hand up for that. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Okay. So, so there's one. So, uh, Perfect segue to you, Dr. Randerwerk, and you know you, you need to give your uh, uh, minority report. <laughs> no, I I, um, I on purpose um, mentioned that I could imagine that it would be a first line therapy, also because um, Pat saying that it was not, maybe not possible, um, because I think in some some patients in particular, where you have some arguments and also maybe a profile that is very highly likely that the patient would be a good responder and that on the other hand it's highly likely that with CPAP you will only lose some trial time and trial money then I can imagine in particular situation that this is indeed a potential first line but again this is of course for a small, smaller group of selected patients in which we believe it's highly likely that it will be a successful treatment. So it has many aspects. I would also like to come back to the dental appliances. I do indeed believe, as mentioned by Pat, that when we are starting prescribing dental treatments for an important medical problem, that the alignment between the dentist and the medical community should be perfect. And this is related to going into the medical file, making a referral letter back and forth and having like a multidisciplinary team that does decision making. And in addition, finally, this should be within a dental sleep professional approach and that the dentist is really focusing within his career on this particular um, treatment. Thank you. A great, a great comments there. Thanks, uh, Dr. Renner. And, uh, you know, I too, you know, envision a situation where, uh, you know, like active duty military, you know, you have a young, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, a military person or a marine who's out in the field, it's going to be difficult for him to be lugging a CPAP or even a dental device. Uh, you know, he may do better with an implanted simulator or for someone uh, who has a pilot's license and uh, does a lot of long distance flying and who's young and skinny, uh, I guess then there is a subsection. So I guess, you know, you, you never say never in medicine. Uh, so, um, but I appreciate the opportunity uh, that you uh, use to express your minority dissenting opinion. Um, uh, I do want to I see a couple of hands go up there pertinent to the topic and then I'll come to you, David. There's, uh, uh, that, that would be both Imran and Keith who want to speak on the same main. Uh, but Imran is a dentist uh, at the University of Arizona, which is part of an integrated healthcare system uh, where they do or are able to see uh, electronic medical records of the sleep medicine providers. So, um, and so setting you up there, Imran. So uh, go ahead, uh, Imran, and then Keith. And thank you, Sai. I, you know, it's uh, um, there's advantages of being in the integrated uh, medical system. I have records. Uh, I have patient access to patients' medical records, so it makes things a lot easier. And when in the past, when I worked in the private practice, that was one of the bigger challenges. So I echo um, on, on you know Oliver's yeah, comments said. Dr. Lone, please mute your, your uh, Thank phone. Thank you. Um, and yes, um, we're getting some feedback. Thanks, Imran. Uh, uh, um, oh, I had I had a few more things. Sorry, si. I was a lot of echo. I wasn't sure if you could hear me. So back to um, should non-PAP alternatives be offered as first-line treatment? And in regards to the dental devices, you know, we have some uh, smaller studies, not as many, uh, that show that for patients with mild obstructive sleep apnea, and again, we're looking at just the AHI number most of the time, is that for the mild cases, the dental device, you know, we're able to lower the AHI. And in uh, majority of the uh, moderate um, or obstructive sleep apnea cases as well. So this really goes back to, you know, giving that patient selection, say, hey, you know, would you give them both the options depending on the severity of their disease. And I've, in, you know, I've been doing this for a number of years. One of the things I notice is um, there's a patient, the younger patients, they tend to prefer the dental device because they say, hey, I don't want to have a mask and a tube and a machine next to my spouse who is in her 30s. It just, um, it just doesn't quite appeal. So they say, I, I, I want to have something that, you know, I can just, slip it in the mouth and not have to worry about any other things. So really it goes back to patient selection, but giving them the alternatives based on what research we have so far, I think that that sounds appropriate. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Imran, well said. Uh, I'm totally in agreement. Keith, and then to David. Yeah, I was just gonna comment so, about, you know, other non-PAP alternatives. Uh, you know, one possibility would be um, emerging therapies such as rapid maxillary expansion and also uh, distraction osteogenesis with maxillary ex expansion, just because, especially for children, you know, they're kind of limited in, in the options. It's either a dental tonsillectomy, a CPAP or orthodontics. Um, so, you know, there, there should be some consideration of, of things like these newer procedures like um, RME, just because it's been shown that you know, the army e can um, improve not only children, but there have been some trials in adults as well. And, it, and the studies that have been published have indicated that it also uh, tends to improve the, the nasal breathing. And there's also some emerging data that with the RME, it can also um, reduce the sizes of the uh, tonsils and the adenoids. So that also might be considered um, you know, possibilities for adoption as first-line therapies uh, for children, but maybe also for adults down the road. Thanks, thanks, Kate, uh, for bringing that uh, pediatric perspective as well as other uh, surgical approaches uh, for sleep apnea management as alternatives. And so I see David, Dennis, Najib, Rick, and uh, Jonathan, and then Joseph in that order with their hands raised. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, any of you were talking the same thematic area. I guess yeah. all of you are. Yeah, so David, go ahead. So I, I wanted to suggest that there are some lessons that we could learn from history, um, because the problem that you alluded to, which is that the assessment of the effectiveness of a therapy, which is not predictable 
oral appliance being perhaps one of the one that we have the most experience with, but even the others, um, th th there's a problem of cost. And, and I would like to suggest that the, the uh, institutions like the SRS and, and the, uh, the ASM and, and the European equivalents to those uh, and, and some of the other uh, country-based uh, associations could play a role here. So when we had CPAP, what was done was we had a titration and um, uh, the, the effectiveness of the treatment was evaluated right then and there with a second night or a split night study. And it took a while, but eventually the, uh, the payment agencies, Medicare being the model, but many of the others followed, basically set up three levels of payment for the evaluation and treatment of sleep apnea. There was a diagnostic payment for a sleep study. There was discussion and eventually some as agreement that you would pay for an evaluation study. And then there was the payment for the device and the long-term maintenance, which uh, a few years back was evaluated at three months and they decided whether you would continue paying or rent it for the first part. So there was three pieces to the treatment. I think we should learn from that model and we should be thinking about how to do that in the reversible forms of therapy, mostly devices. So obviously you can't do that for surgery, but you can do it for an oral appliance. And I haven't heard too many models that separate it into those three levels. The first being proof that the person has sufficient disease. The second being payment for the evaluation that the treatment actually works separate from long-term maintenance treatment. And that again is a little complicated in that you, you, know, you kind of pay for the device up front and, and then use it. But there are ongoing costs which don't necessarily need to be approved. We've all had experience with patients who've had an oral appliance fitted and we know it doesn't work because we've done a sleep study that shows no change whatsoever, but the patient swears that it's good and wants to continue using it. And I think that you know the payment agencies have the right to demand some evidence either that the AHI goes down or that some metric such as sleepiness goes down or some other proof that this is worthwhile. And along with that comes the issue of adherence. It costs money to put an adherence monitor into an oral appliance. We try and do it, but we are often stymied by the fact that that's basically not possible if nobody's willing to pay for it. And I think the society should take the position that they require evidence that something works and evidence that it's used as sort of non-negotiable to payment for that device. Patient wants to use something that we can't say works, you know, that, that's always their prerogative, but, but if the society is gonna pay for it, if the insurance company is gonna pay for it, we need proof. That standard probably needs to be pushed for our societies and we should be saying, look, we want payment for evaluation. We want payment for judgment of adherence wherever that's possible. It's now possible for oral appliance. And if another device comes out, a position, you know, enhancing treatment uh, device, which are out there but not used very widely, the same should be required. People must use it to have it paid for. People must show that it works before we'll consider it. And those three payments by the third parties should be separated. It shouldn't just be if you have sleep apnea, will pay for an oral appliance. There should be a, a gradation. And I think that would help enormously in implementing it. Um, I, I'll stop there. All right, that's great. Uh, it's a perfect segue, David, that uh, what you just said is, you know, you're just clearly encapsulated this Riley-based purchasing of bundled care uh, where people are interested lives of its sleep apnea to take care of uh, and so that they actually show show the money, you know, show the proof and show the evidence. And so they, a perfect segue to, uh, to someone like Dennis uh, who does health services research in a, uh, in an integrated healthcare system. So I, Dennis, I know you had a separate question. Maybe you may want to touch upon this as to how KP handled this and uh, whether you folks do value-based purchasing and lives that you need to take care of sleep apnea and then segue into your question. Yeah, certainly, uh, it, you know, our community is uh, limited by the infrastructure. Uh, and uh, the one that uh, certainly David highlighted is the process in which, uh, you know, patients are identified to be appropriate candidates and then which devices are paid for um, and so forth. Um, I do come from a system where we have a lot of flexibility. 
Um, we, you know, there are general guidelines in terms of uh, trying to uh, identify proper patients uh, and so forth, but ultimately it is the physician's decision in regards to um, whether a patient should be on this kind of therapy or that kind of therapy. And I don't have to jump through a lot of hoops, you know, trying to get, you know, oral appliances ordered and covered for patients. I don't have, I don't have to jump through a lot of hoops, even trying to get like BiPAP ST, you know, for example, for a patient with respiratory failure. So a lot of it is really just based on clinician judgment. It does afford us a lot of flexibility as it relates to our approach and philosophically, and so I do have three points. Um, you know, philosophically, we need to give patients options. And I think the answer to that is absolutely yes, even if it simply just allows for the patients to, you know, um, feel more ownership um, over their care and management. Um, so, you know, with that, should, you know, non-PAP therapies be considered um, as first-line uh, treatments? And I think the answer to that is clearly yes for select therapies, um, especially for um, oral appliances. Um, and I think we're going to have to go to that point, uh, especially with the Phillips recall, you know, making a big dent into, you know, the availability of PAP devices, for, you know, perhaps for the next year. And we're going to have to start rationing. Um, we're, you know, going to have to proceed with emphasizing oral appliances uh, for those patients who are considered to be good, um, you know, candidates. Point number two, and this is uh, kind of going back to the previous slide. Um, and, and sorry, I was a little bit late. Um, you know, we are big believers in that we should be man managing the patient and not the number. And the number I'm specifically referring to is the AHI. Um, you know, if people have heard my previous talks, I'm a big believer that sleep apnea should be a clinical diagnosis supported by numbers and not a number diagnosis supported by, uh, by you know, symptoms. Um, but, you know, I can share a quick example of a patient who came to me with an AHI of 102 who could not use CPAP because of very severe aerophagia put the patient on an oral appliance um, and his AHI went down to two. Um, and the reason that I did that was because, you know, when you look at the sleep study tracings, he had, you know, a, just a, he had mostly hypopneas and uh, they were very short. So a lot of arousals causing him to be symptomatic. Um, so this is a patient who probably had a stable P crit and a low arousal threshold. Um, didn't take very much to open up his airway uh, with an oral appliances and his AHI went down to two. But I think, you know, traditionally, th that would probably be considered to be malpractice. Um, so we do need to come up with better ways of being able to identify good candidates um, and how we're, um, it, which you know, could be alternative metrics, such as, you know, apnea hypopnea indices, um, distribution of ODIs, you know, and so forth. Um, you know, but I think the, the overall push is for us to treat the patient and not to treat the number. My final comment relates to Dr. Strollo's, um, you know, comment about, uh, alternative workflows or better integrated workflows. So in our, in our center, we actually have incorporated two dentists um, that are not paid by Kaiser. Um, they are paid, uh, you know, uh, per device, um, but we've got them uh, credentialed to work in the Kaiser system. So they have access to our EHR and then they work on site. Um, so we provide them an office and they, they do all their uh, oral appliance work there. And it makes for a very, very streamlined process and an excellent um, experience for our patients. They know that if they have any kind of issue with sleep, they go directly to this one location for all their sleep care. Um, they also, the dentists also then have access to, um, you know, a sleep study, um, you know, collaborating and consulting with the sleep physician, um, you know, because we're all in one site. So um, that's a model that we've adopted that we've found to be very helpful, a big believer in integrate in the integration of dentists um, as a uh, as a real benefit. Uh, sorry, excellent uh, comment there, Dennis. And I think your point about integrating the dentists uh, by them being providers with credential but not part of the system uh, is great and very pertinent to the next topical domain of multidisciplinary care models. So. Uh, thanks for those uh, comments regarding to individualizing treatment of the patient, not the number, uh, and I think uh, that was uh, flushed out uh, very nicely uh, in the earlier discussion as well. So thanks for summarizing that, uh, Najee. 
Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I agree with a lot of what's been uh, said. And uh, I'm in Canada, so maybe the insurance issues are a little bit different than in other places, although I suspect they're similar. Um, you know, we're lucky because uh, we have Dr. Almeida who works at UBC. We can send patients and, and get an expert uh, to do it. And definitely there are individuals that um, I've sent as first line therapy to get a dental appliance. They tend to be younger individuals, usually single males, you know, some snoring, mild to moderate disease, those things. I think that would be kind of very reasonable uh, to do. And I do believe that in general, um, even as an alternative to CPAP, probably dental appliances are under underutilized. So I, I agree with that comment as well. Uh, one of the uh, struggles that, that I have or the challenges I have, and maybe one of the dentists can can comment on this, is that at least in our institution, given, giving someone a trial of CPAP doesn't really cost very much. It's a fairly trivial cost. And after a month of CPAP, you kind of know whether the person is going to respond or have a good sense of whether they're going to be adherent or, or those things as well. The problem with the dental appliance is that for someone to get fitted with a dental appliance, it's kind of a long-term commitment. So it's it's a marriage as opposed to a date. So uh, what happens is they get fitted, you know, they get a few months of uh, treatment and, and adjustments. And then at the end of that three months, probably a substantial proportion of them actually will not really respond to the therapy and they'll have to get something else anyways after kind of all that cost and, and all that effort on the patient's part as well. My understanding is that a lot of the boil and bite appliances, they don't really predict who will respond to an actual real dental appliance because of stretching of the jaw or those things as well. But yeah, I just don't know if there's some way to get an idea of who's going to really respond to them so that you don't have individuals paying a lot of money for the dental appliance or whether the insurance company pays for it. And then at least in Canada, a lot of times, if the insurance company pays for the dental appliance, then the insurance company will not pay for CPAP, you know, uh, after that, because they they usually say, oh, you can only have one or the other. So uh, from my standpoint, that's sort of been my struggle or challenge with using dental appliances in a kind of more uh, broad, uh, broad patient base, because I do agree that in general, the symptoms of the side effects of dental appliances tend to be a little bit less, you know, than CPAP uh, as well. Thanks, uh, Najib. I, 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 you know, you brought up nicely, you know, one uh, facilitator, you know, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dennis was talking about how to bring the dentist into practice and then, uh, you know, some barriers uh, also that you identified. One of the things in the comments that came up was uh, by Dr. Serkin, Lee Serkin, who commented about, uh, you know, credentials and specialization or uh, quality of care. Uh, uh, that needs to be standardized, as well as uh, barriers related to out-of-pocket expenses uh, when people, uh, you know, have to see a dentist and they have to up their out-of-pocket costs if uh, their medical insurance doesn't cover uh, is high. And also, I can speak to a local barrier, which is a lot of the dentists in certain cities or areas don't take uh, Medicare Medicaid patients uh, because they don't want to come under the CMS. Uh, umbrella of uh, scrutiny and rigorous and torturous, uh, you know, regulatory barriers uh, and audits. And so that really leaves out a big sector of uh, certain communities with a higher proportion of uh, lower SES out of the mix that uh, the only way they're getting it is to go on a payment plan structure to be able to see that. So I just wanted to throw another, you know, barrier there. We talked about some facilitators and so wanted to throw that uh, barrier there and I would love to hear uh, the comments from our dental colleagues in relation to that. So with that, I'm going to go to Rick. Uh, Rick, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I applaud uh, Dr. Wang. Patients are not numbers, you know. Um, they are patients. So you know, we're not treating a number. We're treating a patient. And um, and back to Patrick. Uh, Pat, um, uh, uh, the question is, I have a patient sitting in front of me who has obstructive sleep apnea. And I know physiologically, the treatments are different. I mean, CPAP does things differently than hypoglossal nerve stimulation does something different from an oral appliance. So there are different physiologic um, approaches in terms of relieving the pathology. But um, so what do you tell your patients? What's the probability that this is going to work? Is CPAP going to work or is a hypoglossal nerve stimulator going to work or is an oral appliance? Yeah, a great point. Do you want me to comment on that, Rick, or, or was that? I'm asking Pat, so, okay. Sorry, sorry, uh, Rick, I, I, I didn't catch that. Go ahead, Pat, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so so again, it, it comes back to having the patient in front of you, and, and, I, and I think Oliver kind of summarized this. Uh, it, you know, I mean, would there be an instance where we would move right to, uh, 
you know, an upper airway stimulator. You know, I mean, I suppose somebody, you know, an older woman who's a dentalist who might have, you know, problems wearing, you know, has headache syndrome, can't wear anything on their head. Yeah, that's the possibility. Um, in, in a young adult, as was mentioned by uh, Dennis, um, you know, who's snoring is, is uh, a big issue that's affecting intimacy and may have mild sleep apnea. Absolutely, I would I would tell that person that I think an oral appliance would be you know good first line therapy. In somebody who is you know ob, you know has a BMI of 35, wouldn't be a candidate for an oral uh, for upper airway. Wouldn't be an ideal candidate for upper airway stimulation. Uh, you know, 50 year old man who's has a BMI of, of 35 and has severe sleep apnea you know, and, and is sleepy, you know, I would recommend, you know, PAP therapy. So, you know, you do have to individualize your treatment and, and that's the value added of a sleep physician to be able to, you know, take a careful history and do a physical examination and tailor the treatment to the patient. So I don't think there's any um, administrative thing that you can do from an insurance company to say, Oh, everyone under age 50 needs to get an oral appliance. I, I think that would be too naive and, and be too simplistic. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, and I like your statement. I'm like you. I, I discontinue a fair amount of CPAP in some people who don't really need it. You know, you see somebody with an, who's asymptomatic with an age of 10, they're on 15 of CPAP. So like, give me a break. But um, that doesn't mean they don't need it, but, but we assess that. But, but in, when I sit a patient in front of me, I tell them across the board, you know, CPAP is probably 95% effective. Um, now they might have obesity hyperventilation, they may have comorbidities, they may have complex sleep apnea, but it's, you know, it's pretty, it's, it's approaching 100%, but the oral appliance, I'm not quite as confident. And I tell them across the board, 50% probability that this is going to work. Upper airway surgery, 50%. Hypoglossal nerve stimulator, I hedge, maybe 70% with, but all of it depends on selection. Um, of the individual. I also would tell them if you're lean and mean and you're positional, then the probability of an oral appliance working is much higher. Uh, again, so, but those are the starting points. The probability that this works based on literature is this. And then we modify it, as you said, based on the phenotype of the character or the phenotype of the uh, patient. So am I wrong? No, I, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, again, it comes down to patient-centered care, right? Um, yeah. So I, I think we've exhausted that topic. <laughs> so I, we might want to. I yeah, yeah, move on. I agree. Not a hundred percent. If not a hundred percent. A quick comment from Imran, and then we will hop over. Add to something, Johnson. please. There, there yep. are a couple of questions that had come up. You know, one of them was the cost. Um, the dental device, if you go to a private practice person in the United States, is about three thousand five hundred. Uh, um, and another had come up: patient with prescribed dental device, can they go and get a CPAP afterwards? So one thing that we know is dental device is a custom-made device. It only fits that particular patient. We can't just go, uh, you know, say, hey, if it doesn't work for one, we can move it on to the other. So insurances recognize that and they say, if, well, the dental device didn't work for you. And we really, we, the, the, there's no other way to move that device to somebody else. So we will prescribe you the CPAP. I haven't heard that being an issue going from dental device to CPAP. For the patients here, and there may be that I just haven't heard, but I know there is a big issue if patients were given CPAP, they go through the trial period of 30 days or 90 days, and they don't return the machine back to the vendor, then the insurance says, well, we, they already, we already gave you the CPAP, why do you want another alternative treatment when you already have one at home? That's a really big issue for us um, in the United States with insurances, and worse is really Medicare. And I want to say 2019 is when they came up with this new rule. They said, if you had a CPAP, um, we will not prescribe you an alternative treatment for five years. So if you had CPAP, you used it for 90 days, you couldn't tolerate it. We already paid for it. Now you're stuck for the other 40 months um, with no treatment. And that's really 
big issue for us because one of the things I said, so why did the patient fail CPAP? Can you give us a good reason? Most of the reason that comes from patients is I didn't like the tubing and the mask. So, you know, it would have been helpful if there was an algorithm um, in the uh, treatment therapy or treatment failure algorithm to say, hey, we're following this algorithm set forth by the group. And this is the main reason the patient did not tolerate CPAP. Can you please approve the dental device? Um, and we have thousands of patients, I believe, that go untreated for the same reason is they're given CPAP. It's been 90 days. They don't tolerate it and they're stuck with it. How can we fix that issue? Is you know, If there was an algorithm to justify, to show medical necessity because the, the symptoms didn't improve or, or something didn't change would be helpful. Along mm -hmm. those lines, so the other group for us to involve are the vendors. I think we need to educate our vendors to relay the message to the patients that you have 30 days because if you don't return it or 90 days, depending on insurance, if you don't return this machine by then or don't make a decision, you may not be able to get an alternative treatment based on your insurance. I think really patient education on type of treatment and how long they have for the trial period will be very, very helpful for us. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Imran. Those are thorny issues. Uh, and um, I didn't know about the five-year rule uh, until you, you, know, you sort of brought it up. Um, so I guess we have to, all the more reason, we need to choose the first therapy wisely. And based on what David said, if there's a way we can predict that, uh, you know, that would be great. Um, so, um, uh, Jonathan has had his hand raised uh, for a while. Uh, uh, Jonathan? Uh, hi. Sorry. I ho hopefully there's not too much background noise here. Uh, no, what I, yeah. what I was going to say, I mean, most, most, of, most has been already said, but what I was going to say in, in our practice, I, I have a sleep dentist. I have Dr. Feigenbaum, who actually works with me. Yeah. We offer from the outset, really, uh, patients either therapies and the only the only caveat or the only hesitation I have is when patients have significant hypoxia uh, and I know that they probably that probably won't be resolved especially if they have you know significant REM related hypoxia they probably won't get total normalization of that with oral appliance therapy and I agree with the notion that it's much quicker to get CPAP I mean I can get CPAP turn around probably within five days from the time I see the patient. And obviously it takes a lot longer. So that is a consideration. And I think the other, fr the frustrating, I mean, John Viviano brought up about how, how many of his sleep colleagues have no interest in prescribing or applying therapy. It's, it's just unconscionable, but I think obviously it goes both ways. I think some of our discomfiture with oral appliance therapy really stems from the fact that a lot of pay, a lot of sleep dentists or at least people who claim to be sleep dentists really aren't following up in terms of retesting patients. So as David uh, uh, Rappaport mentioned, I mean, obviously if we have an improvement in symptoms, that's, improved, that's important, but we also obviously want to see some objective reduction in, in HI if we can. But, but the, the, the other thing I would say is that that in terms of the hypoglossal nerve stimulation, I, I really say that that's, that's really a niche that potentially our patients that are not going to do as well with oral appliance therapy. Maybe, maybe Pat can comment on that. I, I would ar argue that, you know, the patients that have, a, you know, an unreactive hypoglossal, uh, uh, Jenny glosses uh, during non-REM and REM, and have significant hypoxia are also probably not going to do that well with oral appliance therapy, but actually may do very well with hypoglossal nerve stimulation. So we're sort of not cannibalizing on each other either. I think obviously we can, we can have a, a nice symbiosis here at the end of the day. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, you know, thanks so much for touching that because I, I know I do, you know, if we are diagnosing and treating only 20% of patients with sleep apnea, and there's uh, turf-related uh, issues that are going on. There are many comments in the Q&A uh, about, um, uh, you know, getting credential in these practices, gaining entry into these practices, um, having to not be able to, for dental practices to work with the DME or with the physician practice as a part of the practice. 
So many regulatory barriers uh, that are there, it's almost like a silo system. At a time that we are diagnosing and treating only 20% uh, of the uh, population uh, with obstructive sleep apnea. So I really appreciate that comment, uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, that you made. And it also touches upon something that I just want to take a pause and note here, is, is that uh, we have folks uh, from the dental side, as well as from uh, the respiratory side, as well as you know, sleep side, de novo, uh, that we are discussing here. And, and I think we're learning a lot, and I hope uh, the attendees are learning a lot. And I, I believe that there's actually this sort of discussions uh, that are very, very fruitful and valuable, as David alluded to at the start of this, is you know, what, what, are, what are the next steps? Where do you want to go with this? And uh, one of the things I just wanted to say is that it's very heartening to have this uh, combined discussion. And as Craig was, uh, uh, you know, commenting about uh, this, is that there is there should be more opportunities for societies. And I know Lee Serkin did, uh, you know, a great job um, uh, being a cardiologist and sleep physician, bringing the dental group and uh, sleep medicine group together to have combined conferences. But I do think that there is an opportunity for the APSS. Uh, a multi-society, multi-specialty, multi-disciplinary meetings uh, that uh, there should be uh, participation by dental societies. You want to get into the mix, uh, you want to get into that mix, and you want to have the discussions and in those uh, professional society and annual meeting venues and so that these kind of thorny issues can be flushed out because uh, there are some barriers that we are not even aware of that exist, uh, both uh, scientific uh, knowledge-based as well as practice-based barriers that are there uh, that we could succumb, um, circumvent or overcome more easily if we uh, understand them better and find solutions uh, so that we can present them as a combined multi-society uh, group uh, to the regulatory bodies of uh, the payers so that they can allow these barriers to reduce so that, again, we can put that patient in the center of the conversation and uh, benefit the patient directly. Uh, so, David, I know you've been having your hand up, uh, so I'm going to segue uh, over to you, uh, David. But I just wanted to also, sorry, uh, take a pause here. Um, I do see, I'm going to write this order down. It's uh, David, Dennis, uh, John, uh, and um, Joseph uh, in that order. Uh, but if you can just uh, put your hands down on your uh, um, uh, uh, Zoom. I, I do want to touch upon something that was raised earlier uh, with Dennis raised, uh, which was, you know, with the view of the Philips device recall, uh, there is a shortage of uh, device supply. And and, um, and that kind of pinged, uh, picked my ears up. So, uh, Jonathan and Rick, both of your hands are up uh, just to let you know. Uh, you may want to take it down if you don't want your vote counted for something you're not voting for. <laughs> um, so the question is, how many of you in your practices are seeing, in light of the Philips device recall, how many of you in your practices are seeing a, um, uh, a supply chain issue with CPAP de devices delivery or uh, installations? So how many of you? So raise of hands. Uh, three, four, five, six. Um, so I counted Rick, David, Dennis, uh, Pete, uh, and uh, Randa Workin, and Joseph. Sorry, that's six, seven, eight, actually eight. Uh, how many of you, so put your hands down, how many of you have not seen a supply chain issue with uh, your CPAP deliveries? Uh, actually, I haven't, strangely. Um, I haven't, yeah. And Rick hasn't either. Uh, so I guess, Rick, we are in the minority. Um, I just wanted to, you know, take a pause uh, over there so that uh, we have a sense. Obviously, this is a, not a good, uh, you know, a way of looking at this, but there is um, um, something I just wanted to put it out there. So I'm going to go back to my original order. It's David, Dennis, John, and Joseph. So David, you're up. And after this four, we need to go to the next topical domain, which is very related. So I, I, I wanted to come back to this issue of evaluating oral appliances before paying for them or separating the payment for the oral appliance into an evaluation phase, which I advocate for. Um, and, and the issue of the boil and bite was kind of mentioned and dismissed. I think you have to be careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. For hypoglossal nerve stimulation, we were successful in getting the uh, payers to approve an approach that was justified, which says 
we're going to have this relatively expensive procedure, the, the, the DICE procedure, where there's an anesthesiologist and an OR, and it's, I don't know what it costs, but it's not cheap, before we will authorize the placement of the device. And if you look at that literature critically, it is predictive, but it's not perfect. And yet we accept that it's good enough. I would suggest to you that the boil and bite or the what was until recently available, the matrix uh, titration device made a prediction and it was not perfect. But in fact, I think it was probably pretty good at, you know, making an improved chance of success. Certainly, if you have a boil and bite and you have absolutely no benefit, I think that that can be taken as a sign that this is going to be a difficult patient where you might want to consider a more aggressive push of an, another therapy such as CPAP. Whereas if it's dramatically effective, but not perfect, you might want to say, well, I think I can do better with a definitive device. This should be paid for. And I would suggest that we should take the same approach, not throw out a treatment that, or an evaluation procedure just because it's not perfect, but rather push for the idea that it stratifies the need for reimbursement. So I would argue if I was making a pitch to Medicare or CMS, that they should pay for an evaluation with a disposable or, you know, they, they, they'll put forward a relatively low reimbursement so that the dentist is encouraged to come up with a way to decide how the patient will respond. And then a separate payment, an additional payment, if it's successful, and no further payment until the dentist submits some kind of now literature proven uh, therapy that, that it is an alternative. I think that would make an enormous difference in the number of people who were evaluated for and therefore shown to be effective as well as the people who were not given oral appliances and pushed back towards CPAP. And it would solve some of the problems of, you know, which therapy do you go with first? It would allow people to evaluate and triage rather than saying, well, boil and bites don't work or the matrix therapy isn't, isn't a, available anymore, but some other form of that may, may come out uh, shortly. And you would use that and say, well, that will triage me and give me an 80% chance of success instead of a 30 or 40 or 50% chance of success with my oral appliance. Uh, and that's what I'm going to pay for. Yeah, great point, David. Uh, th uh, Dr. Van Der agrees with you as well. Uh, and I like the way he said that, you know, it should be something like a dice for MAD. Um, and not a you know boil and bite uh, kind of situation, um, but I did want to give the the dental uh, providers uh, you know an opportunity here. And I just didn't know whether a short term predictor is actually you know going to be good or as good as eighty percent, and whether some of those changes won't be seen at the short term, like a dice for MAD, but it's uh, something that's an effect of time and how the ligaments pull, stretch, and whatnot. So. Just wanted to pause there for a second to give the dentist an opportunity to respond to that as to whether there's a predictor tool or approach uh, that can categorically uh, exclude people who may not be successful candidates. Any takers, Imran? Yeah. Yep. So with the dental devices, you know, it's a gradual um, advancement of the mandible. So if we do boil and bite, um, and we just start them, you know, bring the jaw out all the way in a short period of time. We know within two or three days, they may develop TMJ pain or uh, myofascial pain, you know, muscles of mastication. Then that will automatically deem as a failed treatment. The, really, the ideal way to do a dental device is to start them with just a slight protrusion of the mandible and over, you know, six weeks or some take even longer is you gradually bring that mandible forward. They're giving the ligaments, the tissue time to stretch um, and, and get used to being stretched gradually over time. So really in, in the short term um, with, the, with a boil and bite, really it's not going to give us um, a good predictor to say this is a, a going to work for you or not going to work for you. Majority will say, my jaw hurts, I can't use it. But if we compare them to say, we're gonna give you a dental device and gradually bring that jaw forward and then see how well you're doing with it in terms of your sleep apnea, in terms of your adherence, that sounds like a better approach. Uh, 
And Dr. Viviano, thanks, Imran. Uh, Imran, I agree with you 100%, and that's the way I um, um, uh, provide oral appliance care in my practice. I start off very conservatively and work towards the optimum position for exactly the reasons you stated. Now, um, this makes it difficult to do a one-night study at an optimum position. Uh, that's what guessed at, like 70% or whatever, to see if oral appliance therapy work and then use that to determine whether an oral appliance is, is an appropriate approach. Um, this is um, one approach that's being used right now with the apnea guard. And, you know, it, 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 a certain percentage of the time, it's predictive of, of uh, working. And that approach, um, uh, interestingly, when, when Dan Lewandowski published a study um, with the apnea guard on one side and the other side was custom-made appliances, the apnea guard actually got better results in that particular study than the custom-made appliances. Custom-made appliances didn't control for, for vertical, uh, for drop of the jaw, so maybe that had something to do with it. Nevertheless, um, it demonstrated uh, a, a certain efficacy that typically is problematic sometimes with these over-the-counter, you know, um, uh, boil and bite type of devices. At any rate, one of the things Dan Lewandowski has done very recently, and I just heard about this, uh, it's, it's uh, created a software package that he's put out uh, free for everyone, and it's to optimize oral appliance optimizer. Um, uh, I, I can't remember the exact name, but uh, nevertheless, what it does is over three nights of sleep, home sleep test, the device of your choice, as long as it also captures a position. Um, and uh, he evaluates baseline, then with the apnea guard in place at 70%, and then uh, with some type of a positional aid, like for instance, his night shift, or it could be something else that's keeping the patient off their back, and then does an automatic calculation and determining whether PAP is the only thing that's gonna help this patient, or positional therapy alone will help this patient, or oral appliance and positional therapy is the optimum, or the oral appliance is what's needed. So, you know, this is a, 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 an automated system that could be used if one uh, discounts the concern with night-to-night -night variability. Uh, there's always limitations to, to whatever one does, but this is we have so much cool technology available to us. And this is creative thinking to see how we can come up with solutions. This is just one approach. And I thought I'd throw it out there because I think it speaks to a lot of what we've been discussing right now and that the payers may be interested in, in this type of approach to, to fast track to a, to, to a solution. Realizing, as Dr. Rappaport said, there's no perfect um, you know, uh, uh, approach that we can take. It, because of the reasons Imran uh, mentioned that with oral appliance therapy, sometimes it takes three months before you get them into that optimum position, before they can comfortably manage wearing their appliance in that optimum position. So how are you going to get a quick answer for that particular individual? There's always going to be patients that you cannot capture the most accurate information for with uh, how well an oral appliance will work. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, John. Uh, great points there. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, uh, Dennis, to you, and then we have to switch topical domains uh, if there are uh, no other hands raised, and there aren't. So uh, you have the last word on this uh, domain. Oh, and Joe, uh, and then uh, we move on to the next. So, Dennis. Uh, I am going to throw my support behind David Rappaport. I kind of have to because he's my mentor. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we have an extensive experience with using uh, temporary boil, boil and bite oral appliances um, uh, within our um, setup. Uh, I, I don't know how many we've done. We've probably done, we've certainly done hundreds. Um, and uh, we did publish uh, in, as an abstract, uh, I believe a couple of times, um, our experience in looking at the, at least the positive predictive value of those who respond to the temporary oral appliance to the uh, custom oral appliance and the positive predictive value was greater than 90%. Uh, the patients also you know, were able to use uh, the temporary oral appliance as a way to kind of gauge whether they like the oral appliance and they think that they would use it long-term. Um, and then finally, because you know, the custom oral appliances can take some time to uh, you know, deliver, um, the patients had a bridge therapy until they got their, um, their custom oral appliances. So I think there's a lot of benefits 
uh, potentially to, to using a, a boil and bike. Now, having said that, um, you know, there's perhaps a couple of areas of, you know, possible research. Um, you know, first of all, and I know Dr. Bogan had said, you know, oral appliances and non-PAP therapies are 50% effective. And yeah, it's possibly, that's, I mean, it's true, but there's a spectrum there, right? You know, you have some patients who respond, you know, 0% and some patients who respond 100%. So really, you know, trying to identify good candidates is really the key to this, especially since I think a big barrier for a lot of sleep clinicians is not knowing or not having the confidence of who's going to be a good candidate. So whether it's a temporary oral appliance, uh, you know, as a mechanism, I think we also need to invest um, in trying to develop novel metrics. You know, I had shared a, a patient, uh, you know, earlier on when age I have 102 and the oral appliance made it go, the AHI go down to two. Um, and the patient had a very low apnea hypopnea ratio, you know, and other novel metrics, I think, uh, you know, certainly need to be investigated. Um, the uh, other area is certainly a research. I know there's been a little bit of work here is, you know, well, and this relates a little bit to the previous slide, how we define effectiveness. Um, you know, what's better, you know, an oral appliance that's 50% effective for eight hours or CPAP that's 100% effective for four hours and then they rip it off and sleep for another four hours. Um, and, uh, and so trying to understand, uh, you know, the, the AHI, you know, with a proper ratio of sleep time, um, you know, I think is, uh, is gonna be critical, um, you know, and, you know, with the onset of, you know, wearables and so forth, I, I think we may be emerging into, an, um, into a time, into a period, in which uh, that may become more possible. Great, uh, thanks. And as uh, uh, Joseph has been waiting for quite a time, uh, go ahead. Uh, oh, you're muted, and there's two of you. <laughs> oh, I'm not able to hear you, Joseph. Uh, you're muted. Uh, can Sorry. you unmute? I, I won't. Yeah, I won't reiterate the comments on therapy. I think there's a couple discussions. One's really on therapeutic efficacy. And I, I'm going to not go there because it, I think it, to my view, I, I would like to, I think a patient centric model that looks at, gives patients information and choice, and then allows them to make some decisions in our, in our experience, that has been a very powerful driver. The other part of that process is we offering all the, the therapies, we describe them to them, including for instance, the new excite, the tongue stimulator, letting patients know that grading how severe they are. And we've worked very diligently in the last three years to five years to cultivate and collaborate in a very respectful way with our colleagues from the dental sleep community. Um, they've been respectful in return. And so what we've done is exactly in many regards what David Rappaport has so elegantly described, which is we have a, a quite a seamless referral system. We have the referrals built into our computer network we print off the referral, the order they need to get a sleep appliance should they want it. We give them a copy of their test. They go to the sleep dentist. For some reason, we have a cluster of boarded dental sleep medicine specialists right around us. And they in turn send the patients back if the patient chooses to proceed with the appliance for a follow-up home study. So the, our, our referral docs understand that that's part of the process now. We understand how they work. They've gotten in network with the insurance companies. So the cost of the patients is less. The referral is, is simpler. Um, patients sometimes still choose not to go that route, frequently due to cost. But now the patients have made a decision that's based on their own needs versus us denying them any care. And so we've seen a real uptick in how this works. One, one last thing, dentists and one of the two of the dentists in the past would discuss with us how we weren't referring enough to them. So we audited that process. And what we were able to talk to our sleep dentist colleagues about, again, in the most respectful way, was that the friction in the system actually was the patients not seeking out the care. It wasn't us denying them access. And so we were able to work on that piece of the referral process. Patients were either not calling them or were calling them and not scheduling an appointment for a variety of reasons. And in, instead of it being an accusation that we weren't sending the patients, it became, how do we make that flow better and in turn give patients an option to, to come back as well? So if they decided they didn't want to get the oral appliance, they could very seamlessly come back and see us. And so that sort of network 
uh, approach of non-financially related organizations. And we make it clear to our patients that we have no financial interest in whether they get an appliance or not. It's in a very honorable way. Um, and so every organization has financial issues. So being unaligned with any of the major hospital systems to us is a pure financial situation. The hospital systems have their own set of financial incentives, which are quite dramatic. And so we should just recognize that they exist for everybody. But in closing, we've taken the approach of collaborating in, with our dental sleep colleagues, and they've responded in kind in the most professional and uh, re uh, appropriate way. So I, we've had an extremely satisfying relationship, and it's a bit um, intellectually distressing uh, to hear that that's not going on in other places. But uh, for us, it's been quite satisfying. Yeah, thanks for sharing uh, approaches there, Joseph. Uh, that's amazing work, and uh, it gives other people a roadmap. Uh, thank so you. thank you. For, um, and so we are t at the 10 minute mark. And uh, I, I did want to say, I wanted to take a short uh, vote again. Uh, and Rick, your hand is uh, up, just saying, um, um, which is um, in this thematic topic. Uh, how many of you would offer a uh, dental device as first line of treatment? Raise your hands. Uh, so I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Uh, how many uh, hands down, uh, electronic, Anna, and real? <laughs> how many of you uh, would not offer um, dental device as first line of therapy? Uh, I can show zero. Great. Uh, so that is um, uh, great to hear. And based on all the discussions here, it looks like it's a perfect segue into the uh, next topical in domain. I'm not going to summarize uh, because it was a very rich conversation and we did spill over into the next, um, uh, uh, a, you know, a multidisciplinary care model, which is what I'm going to go. So essentially, we're going to solve uh, healthcare delivery in the sleep apnea world in uh eight minutes <laughs> and so uh, um having said that um i did want to throw out some of the multidisciplinary talk that has already come i, I think it's a great model that dennis shared about you know dentists um having a credential but not being part of the practice so uh, imran patel is at the university of arizona he's actually um you know uh, employed physician but he has his own you know dme and he's a separate uh, you know cost center and all of that so there are models that can be operationalized. And of course, prior to a dentist being uh, in, in our sphere, uh, we did uh, you know, refer a lot of our patients out to a couple of dentists in town, but uh, there were some you know, barriers which were you know, very nicely articulated by Joseph. Um, so I just wanted to throw out uh, the, these two uh, sort of ideas and models. There's a very nice paper that was forwarded to me by someone, by Dr. Sunil Sharma in West Virginia University, who wrote an article about how you know dental sleep practices can be incorporated into a multidisciplinary practice? So, uh, I would suggest uh, you all you know uh, find that article. I apologize, we don't have a, a you know references uh, you know included as part of this discussion. Um, but I just wanted to say that for the lung transplant, as an example, there are these multidisciplinary clinics in transplant where there is a surgeon, there is a physician, uh, there's a social worker. Uh, and, and there's a clinical pharmacist, all four of them are available at the same time. A patient comes in in a multidisciplinary practice, they see all four of them, or three out of the four, or two out of the four, and then they're out, or just one out of the four, and they're out. So it's a huge, you know, when we put the patient in the center, it's a huge convenience factor uh, of that co-location and that sort of multidisciplinary model. Uh, I just wanted to throw out, out there uh, as, uh, you know, is that something that's even possible, um, um, or is there too many uh, regulatory and uh, other barriers that is completely infeasible unless uh, uh, unless there are certain carve-outs of certain uh, countries, uh, you know, where that, that is actually feasible. So, please go ahead. Yeah, so one approach that we've been using um, that I think other institutions also do is that we bring in um, the dentist as a adjunct clinical faculty. So what happens is they can, uh, they're embedded within our, our, our clinic, 
um, on certain days of the month or week. And then what happens is, you know, our fellows can actually rotate to that clinic so they get the teaching experience. The one part that's always been a little bit of a struggle is, is because the um, oral appliances are considered DME, um, uh, you know, uh, that, that part is a little hard to uh, finesse because the, the dentist had, that we brought in, um, uh, you know, she, she actually has a prior practice. So it's a little hard to, to get that piece. Um, but so what she mainly does is, is she goes over the, um, uh, the evaluation, uh, the fitting, and then, and then the follow-up care. But the DME -E part is a little bit um, a difficult thing that we've been uh, struggling with. You're muted, Cy. Si. Oh, thanks, uh, Chief. Uh, uh, Pat. Yeah, um, we, we have a similar experience. Uh, we, um, you know, we obviously been working with Rob Rogers for many years, and uh, our our fellows rotate through his clinic as well as uh, Ryan Seuss's clinic in ENT. The, the the issue of multidisciplinary clinics comes up, you know, in my role as chair of medicine, and you know, it's it's a it's a very patient centered approach. We do this with our ALS clinic. But the, the fundamental problem is it's not very cost effective trying to get multiple, provider, multiple providers in one site and be very efficient. And, you know, where these clinics succeed, you know, on, on the UPMC side are usually in CF and in transplant where there's high dollars associated with supporting the, these efforts. And unfortunately, we just don't have that in the, in the sleep space. Um, telemedicine provides, you know, we've learned a lot during the pandemic, and that may provide at least an opportunity to get people from a variety of different sites to discuss difficult cases. I'm not sure you need it in every single patient that we see. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, that's very well said uh, in terms of how, uh, uh, unfortunately, the dollars uh, drive uh, that decision as to where you can have the convenience of patients and if there's uh, adequate remuneration. Uh, there was a question in the chat group. Uh, I just wanted to say that of uh, uh, at least one practice out there that was actually having barriers for getting CPAPs and they were reserving CPAP machines. But uh, relevant to what was just uh, raised in terms of the uh, uh, dental um, you know, practices is, is that uh, there is a request uh, from uh, one of our attendees that perhaps the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and sleep through society should, uh, you know, some legislative uh, um, action, you know, approaches for how, uh, you know, there could be better access for care for dental devices and such. So um, in terms of insurance coverage, um, uh, as well as, you know, oral appliance being a first choice. And, uh, and I know I'm talking regulatory side, uh, there was a comment from Rashmi Parmar and Imran is very pertinent to you, which is that there is apparently a software glitch in Medicare uh, that um, uh, the, for the E0486, when it's submitted, there's an automatic rejection for the uh, the dental device. So it may be a software glitch uh, that was commented upon. So you may want to uh, look into that. Uh, so uh, I believe Dennis is next. I uh, didn't know if, Rick, you had your hand up on purpose, or, but um, uh, oh, he, you did. Okay. All right. Dennis, uh, I'm sorry, Rick, and then Dennis. Uh, yeah, I would just say um, we actually have a dentist in our practice, and um, it's complicated from a regulatory perspective, but um, we use a, a dental service organization platform to sort of spread the risk um, and to meet the legal aspects of it. But it's been amazingly valuable to have a dentist on board that I can walk down the hallway and talk to and align with. And we, of course, we work with other dentists in the community but it hasn't worked as well. I mean, there's some value obviously in having that person. And, and again, our process has been through this dental service organization, so. Great, uh, thanks Rick. Uh, two minute warning. Uh, so 30 seconds for Dennis and 30 seconds for Viviana. All right, quickly. Uh, yes, fully agree with Dr. Bogan. Uh, incorporating dentists is very valuable. Quick uh, answer to the multidisciplinary model agree to Dr. Strollo. Uh, conceptually, yes. Uh, and in fact, you know, we've incorporated behavioral sleep medicine team. Uh, you know, we're in close collaboration with pulmonary, peds pulmonary, 
uh, inpatient pediatrics, uh, you know, all patients who, you know, little babies who are sick, they get transferred to our NICU and we study them. Um, and all these teams uh, know to directly contact my case managers rather than the physicians. So it's very much a, a team effort with multiple disciplines and the one-stop shop model, I think creates both a better patient experience as well as a, a provider experience because they both know where the hub is. However, multidisciplinary encounters, no, I don't think that works. You know, for home hypertension and ALS that was mentioned, you know, you can do that because of low pre uh, prevalence and high intensity of, of disease. But the prevalence of OSA is just way too high, you know, for this to be cost effective. And in fact, I think we're on the other end of the spectrum where we're using case managers as extenders, physician extenders, to try to increase the volume of patients that we can care for. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, Dr. Viviano, go ahead. Uh, love the discussion on the multidisciplinary approach. And I know of a number of centers around North America that, uh, that have pulled it off and, and do very well with it. Um, just like to suggest that there's something else that we'd like to bring to the table here in the discussion, at least thinking. Um, a better collaboration between physicians and dentists um, would open up so much more uh, care to patients. And Alberta, Canada actually has that in place with guidelines that were written by all the stakeholders, the physicians and the dentists and so forth, the associations. And so we have the dentists there on the front lines, owning the sleep testing uh, equipment, dispensing it, uh, reporting, doing all the proper evaluation like they've been trained to do, and then reporting and working with a board certified sleep specialist that's making decisions and so forth, and then working collaboratively together. So they're not in the same office but it really is a multidisciplinary approach and they are a, a model as to how this can be done, but it requires some changes. Thank you. Uh, those are great comments and I really appreciate the, uh, you know, also the multinational perspective on this. So we are at the top of the hour, or not top of the hour, we are at 9.30, we are at the end of our uh, webinar. Um, I just wanted to give a huge thanks to our panelists uh, for taking time away from their busy schedules I, for this uh, very lively can I make one comment based on what John just said? Because uh, I think sure. there's, if we're going to talk about the success of, you know, oral appliance, um, you know, moving into the future, I think there's one thing that we haven't discussed that's kind of the elephant in the room that probably needs to be put out there, which is there was a lot of distrust between um, the sleep physicians um, and the dentist, right? You know, the, 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 the dentists feel like the sleep physicians, you know, don't believe in their product and uh, are just trying to make a lot of money. And, um, and, you know, they're, you know, trying to, you know, do things that are outside their scope. Right. And, um, and, and that's, you know, how many sleep physicians, you know, feel. Um, so, you know, for oral appliance, I think to become successful, um, we're going to have to bridge that gap some way. You know, and I, the way to bridge that, I think, is a, a much larger discussion that will that, you know, we're not going to be able to do in the next 30 seconds. Um, but I, I think if, if we're going to be successful with this, that's an issue that's going to have to be addressed. Uh, uh, Agreed. Yeah. So taking back his comments. Uh, great comment. Thanks, Dennis. And that's why we are having them uh, so that there could be discussions. And uh, I do think going back, certainly to, uh, back to what uh, Kay had mentioned earlier, uh, um, as well as I, you know, sort of mentioned it, is, is that, you know, the dental societies need to be part of the uh, association of professional sleep societies. I understand uh, that uh, many of them are not. So this will really bring you into the fold for having these discussions at a bigger, more national venue, international venue, so that we can flush this out, so that there can be more trust building, as Dennis pointed out. And thanks, Dennis, for going out in a, in a limb and, you know, uh, um, you know, belling that cat, so to speak. So. I uh, appreciate it very much. I wanted to say a huge thanks to the panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules. It's a two-hour block, but gosh, there's still so much that we want and need to discuss. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, over 100 odd uh, folks uh, that attended uh, the uh, uh, panel discussions and uh, appreciate all of your perseverance and uh, have a safe uh, weekend and stay safe.